Hi, everyone. We're in the process of helping the speaker connect, and then we'll get started. Okay, good. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, hello, Dr. Strickland. Welcome to another night of the Master Beef webinar series. I'm Adela Lonis, and I'll be your host tonight. Uh, just a couple of reminders before we get started. Uh, you can use the Q&A box to ask questions to me or our speaker, and your attendance is being automatically recorded through our Zoom account. So everyone will receive credit for tonight's webinar. Uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. Lou Strickland, and they are here to talk with us about bull health and breeding sadness exams. We are super excited to have them join us tonight, so I'll let him take the floor. And you should be able to also share your screen, but let me know if that's not working. Okay, first of all, do you have me there? Got me on audio? yes okay good all right let's share a screen all right let's start out with we're going to start out with health and then we'll move on to uh, the breeding soundness exam after this all righty someone said i can't see or hear anything at 6 38 okay should you you got my uh, presentation now Yes, we got it. Okay, good deal. All righty. Let's go ahead and get started here. What I've got here is just some general overall health and disease prevention for bulls. This can very easily be applied to heifers as well, or cattle females as well. But this one's kind of aimed just a little bit more towards the male side. So um, as we're going along here, please feel free enter any questions in the chat box i'll stop every once in a while or adele can flag me down and say hey there's a question in the chat box or something uh, but by all means um please ask questions as we go I, I want us all to be on the same page first of all the two things that i think about the most with bulls as far as venereal disease goes and these are the two true venereal diseases of bulls and I guess I could go ahead and say these are the two true venereal diseases of cattle. Uh, there are other diseases that can be passed venereal, but these two are the only ones that can be passed and only passed venerally. One is trichomoniasis, trichomonas fetus, and the other is campylobacter fetus, subspecies venerealis, campylobacterosis. Now, um, some of you may remember an older term uh, and it's still used interchangeably, but not quite as much anymore. But Vibrio, Vibriosis, and Campylobacter is uh, Vibriosis. So uh, we tend not to use that one anymore. 
Um, kind of one of those about the time you learn the answers, they change the question, that type deal. Okay, vibriosis is the old name, and it's an obligate parasite of the reproductive tract. And it is transmitted by natural service. Hmm, I was thinking to say only, but there is another way that it can be transmitted. And we'll go over that here in just a minute. Uh, but for the main part, it is transmitted through natural service. And when I do some diagnosis here, when I stain it on a slide, uh, the, uh, the bacteria has a unique look to it. Kind of looks like seagulls flying there. So uh, kind of a unique organism. Also, trichomoniasis, it is a protozoan. Uh, this is it right next to a bovine spermatozoa head right here. And you can kind of see it's kind of a oblong looking little odd individual. He's got three heads, a three tail, um, excuse me, three head hairs and one tail hair. And it's kind of got an undulating membrane right there. You can see it right here. Kind of looks odd. When you watch this rascal moving around, you can see that um, you can see the membrane kind of fluttering, sort of like uh, flapping in the wind, like a piece of material or something. And these two organisms, both of these organisms cause, like I say, the venereal disease, but they cause an exact same set of clinical signs. So there's no way that I can know, just walk out there and look at my bull and go, wow, he's got campier, or wow, he's got trichomoniasis. Um, they are exactly alike in the clinical signs, and I have to do testing to know the difference between the two. Lives in the male, the male is the carrier. It exists in the microenvironment of the prepucial cavity, and we think, notice I said think, uh, that there is a proper environment there that this organism has learned how to make a living in that reproductive tract. It also can live in the female reproductive tract for a short amount of time, uh, but in the bull, it can live for a lifetime. Um, we can get rid of camping. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But trichomoniasis is much, much more difficult and we're going to talk about the treatment options that we have with either organism. It lives in the smegma. And once again, we think that's a favorable anaerobic environment that's there, that it lives in that smegma. And then as that bull breeds cows, he passes it along. No apparent clinical signs like we talked about. They are completely asymptomatic carriers. You, you don't see anything. I did my master's research in bovine venereal disease. So we could talk the next two hours just on these two diseases, um, but we're we're not going to do that. We're gonna we're gonna keep moving. But in some papers that I found, uh, it mentions that if you're really 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 watching close, you may see a short transient discharge from the bull's prepuce. Notice I said you may. So may you. Most likely you will not, and it lasts for a very short time. So once again, you never know it on these bulls. Uh, younger bulls tend to be able to get rid of this disease. We don't understand why. Also, older bulls tend to get chronically infected. Once again, we don't understand why. A lot of research has gone into it, and we're not 100% sure. There's a lot of speculation, but there's no uh, definite Yes, this is why older bulls become chronically infected. And I did find a couple of papers out of Australia that said, that said younger bulls can become chronically infected as well. The female is the one that bears the brunt of the clinical signs. And I just wanted to go over this real quick about the female. I realize we're talking about the bull tonight. Um, but I wanted to mention this real quick. Because this is where you see the clinical signs, uh, typically infertility, early embryonic and fetal death. When I say early embryonic, I'm talking about before 40 days. And that's what is uh, unique about this organism. A lot of people will call me up, agents or, 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 or producers. Hey, doc, I got, I got a calf. I, excuse me. I got a cow that aborted. What do you think happened? 
Well, uh, then I start asking a lot of questions because I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a crystal ball that I can just look into and, and tell you exactly what happened. So I got to start asking a lot of questions. And one of the first things I'll say, how far along in gestation was she? And if I get that early gestation, uh, the, these are the two diseases I'm thinking about pretty quick uh, because that's when they cause fetal death or embryonic death. Now, mama cow can clear this organism in about two heat cycles. Uh, what's unique about this is the lining of her uterus is mucous membrane. So her immune system is able to see this organism and then clears it and get rid of it. Oh, oh I'm sorry, y'all. Excuse me. Uh, allergies. I'm sorry. I apologize. Allergies are giving me fits. I don't know what's blooming. It may be the ragweed that's blooming. that's really giving me trouble. But uh, she can clear the organism in about two heat cycles. So that's why we typically do not get need to get rid of the cow because uh, she can get rid of it. Now, in a few times, notice I got less than 1% here. She can have a late-term abortion. I found that in the literature uh, that she can go almost full-term or complete full-term and not lose this calf, and that organism can be found within the stomach contents of the calf. But that's rare. Uh, also, it's rare that she carries this organism from year to year, but she can. Uh, that's another reason that I always recommend preg checking cows. And if she's open, I'm sorry, sweetheart, you're costing me money. You got to go. And potentially she could be a typhoid Mary uh, that is carrying disease year to year to year. And um, it's time for her to go. because she. And I saw a case of this where a producer... I uh, had a battery of bulls. Uh, we went down and tested. Sure enough, it's positive for trick. He had a group of open cows, and he did not get rid of those open cows. We go back the next year, and he's got trick again, and he had some cows that carried it to next year. So uh, I highly recommend uh, if those cows are open and you strongly suspect or your veterinarian suspects diseases, venereal diseases like this, uh, that she leaves your farm because she's probably going to cost you even more money. And then also, uh, this is unique too, and you can kind of see it up here in this picture that I've got up here in the corner. Some of these cows can have post-coetal pyometra. It's nothing unusual to see that nice clear discharge on a cow that's in heat, or even after she breeds, you can still see that clear discharge. But if you see that na a nasty discharge like this right after breeding, within a few days after breeding, yeah, you better be calling your vet to come out and check her and even check the bulls to see if there's camp or tricky coming, uh, hanging around. All righty. It is bull to cow and cow to bull. A uh, chronically infected bull breeds a clean cow or a susceptible bull clean, uh, breeds a uh, infected cow. Uh, we talked about that young bull. He can get rid of it. He'll he'll catch the disease. He'll breed a free, free, few, few cows and this get, things get rid of it. So he can be a mechanical vector that's spreading it around. It is not cow to cow. She can't walk up to another cow and uh, exchange saliva or, or aerosolize or anything like that or even riding each other. No. Now, potential is reusing cedars. If you pull a cedar out uh, and then place it in another cow or contaminated applicator, uh, that's a possibility of being able to spread the disease. All right, we're going to need to diagnose it here. Uh, there is a couple of ways that we can do this. Uh, uh, Prepucial wash is typically used in other areas of the world where they'll take literally just take saline, flush it up into the bull's prepuce, and then catch it in a pan. It's called Peter Pan, and then check for it. But typically here in the United States, we do a prepucial scrape. Got a special instrument here. This is the one I prefer right here. This is called a bull rasper. Uh, and you can see those little edges there, and it catches the smegma. Or you can use an equine AI pipette. This is a little more prepuce friendly, and I can use that to collect smegma and test for either disease. 
Uh, then I do a culture for trichomoniasis that's done in the end pouch. And then I do a PCR differentiation because there are fecal trichomonads that can look very, very similar to this trichomonad, but they don't cause disease. And I surely would hate to call a normal bull, a clean bull, just based on looking at a pitcher or a culture and it not be the right organism. So I can do a PCR to differentiate between the organisms. And then Vibrio is put over into Clark's Meat is sent off to the state lab. You can send either one of these tests to the state lab. I highly recommend you're working with your veterinarian to collect these samples. Now, if you're sending a bull to a different state and, and about there's more than 25 or 30 states, I can't remember exactly how many right off the top of my head, that require, and Tennessee's one of these states, if a bull is being transferred across state lines, especially for breeding purposes, and that bull is older than 18 months of age, he has to have a negative trichomoniasis scrape before he goes out. So once again, you've got to work with a veterinarian that is qualified to do that scrape. They have to be certified to be able to sign that health certificate for it to be accepted for that bull to go across state. And the same thing, you're bringing a bull into the state of Tennessee. I'm just going to say from Florida or, or, or Montana, I don't care, wherever. You have to have a negative scrape before it comes in. And that scrape has to be done about three weeks before the bull can come in. Uh, so uh, plan ahead when you've got that bull coming into the state. And then the Vibrio requirement, there's no requirement for Vibrio. And here's that three three tests one week apart after two weeks of sexual rest. So you've got to you've got to plan well ahead. You can't just up and go. Okay, I'm going to send my bull to Montana tomorrow. No, you got it. You got to plan ahead. All right, for a trick, there is not a legal treatment. There is a treatment that'll work. Metronidazole will get rid of this organism, but it's not a legal compound in food animals. I can't do that. It's prohibited. Uh, I use that in a food producing animal. I lose my license. So can't do that one. There is a vaccine that's available. I actually, I, I, t I don't think it works that well in the male anyway, more so in the female, pretty good data out there that shows it works in the female, but not in the bull. Notice I've got AI down here, and this is for both diseases. I can use artificial insemination and get rid of this disease. I mean, I can totally eliminate it. But I recommend you use a certified semen services for the semen. They test for everything under the sun because Trick and Campy will cryopreserve exactly like the organism and when you thaw it out it goes right back to work so be careful when you're using ai make sure it's certified semen services that you're purchasing that semen from or if you've got high enough dollar bull you're using your own semen or uh somebody that you know has high dollar bull and you want semen from that high dollar bull Make sure that that bull is tested before you use it. Uh, and also, this is where I get on my soapbox. Please, please, please do not loan out or borrow a bull. I have seen more than one train wreck where a bull was loaned out or borrowed out and it had trichomoniasis and it spread it to another herd. Please, please, please. Do not loan or borrow a bull. If you do, make sure that bull is tested before he's brought into your herd. And for Campy, now here's where on Campy we are much luckier than we are so with Trick. Vaccination is reported as curative and will uh, prevent it and treat it. So uh, we're pretty lucky here. As I said, my master's research was in bovine venereal diseases. 
I've been in practice for almost 30 years now, been in the research business for about 15 of that. I've seen quite a bit of trichomoniasis. I don't know. I couldn't tell you how much. I have seen zero campy. That doesn't mean that it's not there. I'm just saying that we can prevent and cure this disease much easier than we can trichomoniasis. Okay, bovine reproductive diseases. We're going into viral diseases now. So BBD, uh, you, I know you've heard of BBD virus and then herpes virus or IBR. Uh, IBR, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, is a herpes virus. All righty. This one is spread through contact, and that and it can that can be venereal contact, but it also can be just nose to nose walking up to each other. And uh, one of my instructors in vet school that is a brainwave on BVD. He does BVD research, as in he is the he is the go to guy uh, when you're talking BVD. He was telling me you can take BVD virus and put it in one end of a an olympic size swimming pool pond and it will infect animals on the other end so uh, this disease can be spread uh, much easier than the venereal diseases since we're talking kind of reproduction tonight abortions birth defects um, it also can cause persistent infections also causes pneumonia in young calves. It could cause it in a cow too, but it's more so in young calves, uh, especially those young bulls. And a PI, one that's persistently infected, carries the virus all the time. Uh, they can be spreading it throughout your herd all the time. Uh, there is not a treatment because this is a virus, but I can prevent it through a vaccination program, biosecurity, and testing. Here's what I'm talking about with a PI calf. When I say PI, that calf is persistently infected. It sheds virus 24-7, 365. Since we're talking bulls, right here is what I wanted to point out. This PI calf hanging out in the pasture can go up to this bull, pass it to this bull, it loves to get into the bull's testicles. That is where it likes to go to. So whenever that bull is breeding cows, he is passing virus along to other animals and most likely infertility. Uh, that virus can cause, if you notice right down here, pneumonia, diarrhea, but it can cause other persistently infected animals. It can cause birth defects. It can cause infertility. So Testing for BBD is extremely important, especially if you buy new animals. You're bringing a new animal onto the farm, ear knots that animal. If you're running into issues with infertility on your farm, please excuse me for just a second, y'all. My nose is taking off and I had to catch it. If you're seeing infertility on the farm, maybe you want to ear notch those calves. Make sure you don't have a PI calf. If you find a PI calf, you may want to go test mama, the mama that that PI calf come from, because she could be a PI. So this is where I recommend you work with a veterinarian doing testing, biosecurity, and vaccination protocols. Also, um, PI testing is on the Ag Enhancement Program. They'll pay you like $5 a head to test your calves. And here's what I'm talking about, the ear notching. And you ear notch. I prefer to take the notch from the lower part of the ear right here. But you can take it anywhere, but that's where it's recommended, right there in the lower part of the ear. And if you have to test several times, she'll end up looking like a pig that's been notched. But you go to State Diagnostic Lab, Core Diagnostic Lab. You can also send it to here, uh, UT, and it's no charge, no charge for that testing. You can do it yourself, but once again, I recommend to get a veterinarian involved and don't look at that veterinarian as being as an expense. 
look at that veterinarian as a um a plus to your farm there is a condition called moon uh, excuse me barn blindness barn blindness where you literally walk by something every day and you don't really pay attention to it having another set of eyes there on that farm is a good way to pick up on potential problems uh, where either your extension agent or um a veterinarian walks out there and sees something that you walk by every day and goes hey have you ever looked at that? Have you ever thought about this might be one of your problems? So uh, I've never seen a veterinarian charge more than what it's worth to come out on the farm. Plus, that is also establishing a VCPR, which is necessary for the new over-the-counter medications to get a uh, prescription written for antibiotics. So in my opinion, you're, you're just adding to the value of your farm, having that veterinarian out and, and having that farm visit done. IBR, once again, herpes virus. What this herpes virus likes to do is uh, it lies dormant. It, it gets into the trigeminal ganglion inside the uh, oral around the head cavity, and it, it lies dormant until a period of stress comes along. Boom, it pops back up. Where it likes to show up, and you may have heard it called uh, red nose, causes pneumonia can cause abortions, but also it causes, you You may not be able to appreciate it here, okay, lips of a calf's vulva or a heifer's vulva. You can see what looks like little, little pustules on it, granular pustules. She can have it, and also that bull can have it too on his penis. And I've seen it when I do breeding soundness exams. And usually what I'll do is I'll just stop right then and there on that exam and go, okay, uh, this will eventually go away. Uh, bring him back when, uh, in a few months, uh, let me check him again, make sure that's gone away before I approve using that bull. Let's back up. Thought I had it there on the slide. Once again, this is controlled by vaccination and biosecurity. Okay. Lepto. This is a spirochete. This is the way lepto is passed along. Usually one will abort. Everybody else loves to come out here and check out that calf that's been aborted. Uh, there, I know you've heard the uh, uh, a curiosity kill the cat. Well, curiosity kill the cow too, because you all know how curious they are. It is uh, zoonotic too. If you have this issue right here, you see one aborted, please wear gloves to uh, pick that calf up or feed us up to send off for the lab or you know whatever you're doing because i had a producer did that he sent he, he he found one that had just been aborted he thought he was doing the right thing and he was sending it to the lab to make sure uh exactly what caused that abortion he didn't just chalk it up to oh well and did not use any gloves and he got his own little case of lepto so uh pay attention to this kind of thing there are multiple reproductive diseases uh, that are zoonotic to us. So always wearing gloves. I know we think we're tough. We don't need gloves. Oh, yeah, we do. We, we need them. So wear those gloves. And once again, contact right here. Here's that contact, but it can be spread venereal. It can be bred through infected bull semen, that kind of thing. Now let's break it down just a little bit. Here we are. We're back to the female. I just wanted to point this out because this kind of breaks it down into what vaccine you need to reach for when you're treating this disease. All right, the cattle maintenance host has either Harjo progitno or Harjo bovis. That is the cattle serovar. Then there's others. These are incidentals. Pomona, Bratislava, Canicola, Gripothyphosa. Those are incidental. These are carried by other species carriers coming into your herd pigs rodents dogs uh, deer uh pigs wild pigs uh, feral pigs carry bratislava now there's a vaccine just for the bovine versions called spirovac it has just harjo progitno and harjo bovis i think that's a pretty good vaccine in my opinion uh, uh, pretty good data out there that, that it provides some excellent protection. So I would use this on the bulls too, on the cows and on the bulls too. And typically where you know you need this 
is you may see an abortion here, an abortion there. Do your testing to find out. And it could be just this. If you have an abortion storm, and I've run into this lately, where a producer had an abortion storm, like five, six, seven in a row, and did a little CSI investigation. Sure enough, there was an old pig barn on the farm that cows had access to. He got them all from that area where that old pig barn was. He worked with his veterinarian. They changed vaccines and vaccine protocols and not had any other issues. But if you see these vaccines that have L5 in it, that's what this is. That's the incidentals. And, and it's not that good a vaccine. And that's why it's recommended if you're in an area where there's issues, you got to use it up to four times a year to get protection out of it. Let's prevent it. I've said this biosecurity thing two or three times, paying attention to the water sources. I hate a standing pond. Let's talk for another day. Test those replacement animals coming in. Be consistent with vaccination. Start that early in life and continue on. Work with your veterinarian to see which one you need in your herd. And here we are, vaccines. So now we're moving on to vaccines that we're going to use in our herd. Whatever you use on your heifers, your cows, your females, you're going to use on your bulls as well. So um, a lot of times vaccines are, are really good products. They do the job they're supposed to, but we handle them incorrectly or we give them incorrectly. And that animal does not respond well. We don't give them at the right time. We don't give them in the right manner, not route. And 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 if we don't do what that label says, that label's there for a reason to tell us exactly how to use that product. It's not going to work. Always read the label. I make my vet students... Animal science students, too, raise their right hand and swear they will always read the label before they drop a medication, before they give that medication. That label is going to tell you exactly what to do with it. Lot and serial number. Making sure you're storing it properly at the right temperature. Uh, checking out your, uh, your refrigerator. Go back to that picture. Shoot side. Making sure you're going there to shoot side and keeping it cool properly. Uh, Clyde Lane, um, I know a lot of you probably remember that name, Clyde Lane. He's an awesome individual. This is really smart. I wish I'd have got this, thought of this myself, but I got it from him. What he does is he takes his ice packs, puts it in the bottom of the cooler, then takes an egg carton. He saves egg carton, lays an egg carton on top of the ice pack, and then puts the vaccines inside the egg carton. That's brilliant. That makes that vaccine stay at a more consistent temperature as opposed to it touching one of those ice packs, getting colder on one side than it does the other side of the bottle. Vaccines are, when you break them down to the most simple form of what they are, they're nothing but proteins is all they are. And you get a protein too hot or too cold and it denatures. So using that vaccine properly and keeping up with that lot and serial number is extremely important. Proper technique. Here's that refrigeration that I was talking about. Uh, the BQA coordinator for the state of Tennessee is talking to you. So using that vaccine in the right manner, BQA guidelines. If you read the instructions, it'll tell you what needle size to use. And also changing needles every shot. I know you're going, Doc, you're talking like a tree fell on your head now. Now I want you to change needles every shot. There's multiple diseases that can be passed from one animal to the next by using a dirty needle. So uh, paying attention, taking time, changing a needle, not that expensive, doesn't take that long. Another talk for another day. Okay, killed vaccines. I generally recommend this in a herd that is, kind, that is a closed herd. And once again, I'm talking about female when I get here, minimal risk of abortion. So usually... I will use this in that herd that's closed. You only test animals that, that are clean coming in. You're keeping everything clean. Um, this vaccine does not provide quite as much protection as a modified life, but it does provide protection if you use it properly. A lot of, lot of research out there shows that these vaccines are effective, but you got to use them the way they're listed on the label for them to be effective. 
Uh, read the label. It's going to tell you two initial doses and then a booster. Uh, remember what I talked about the lepto vaccine. The immune is not as long lasting. You may have to booster sometime during the year. All right, modified lives. I usually recommend this in a herd that's uh, kind of a grand central station herd. Animals are coming and going all the time. You're in close contact with a neighbor that does absolutely nothing. Um, the immunity is stronger and longer with these vaccines. Uh, but you do run into, here we go, we're back to the female right here. Greater risk of abortion. So if you've got a female that has never had a modified live vaccine before and you hit her with a modified live vaccine, when she's pregnant, there is a possibility she will abort her calf. If you read the label, they'll tell you, use it while she's open. Then you can use it while she's pregnant. A lot of research out there now showing that use a modified live when she's open. Then a killed while she's pregnant because it's really, really safe, gives good protection. So that's another protocol, another approach that you can do this. Once again, work with your veterinarian to see if that works for you. Here's something else you got to keep up with. You got to mix it. So don't get the bride out, and you got to mix it and use it within a certain amount of time. That label tells you. So don't get the bright idea. I've got 300 to vaccinate. I'm going to, I'm going to mix it all right now and then be ready to go. No, nope. you got to use it within about 45 minutes to an hour after mixing. And of course, keeping it cool the whole time. Oh, uh, so mix it as you need it. Use it as you mix it. I'm, I'm going straight to breeding because this is breeding bulls. We're looking, kind of looking at taking care of bulls. We're going to BSC here in just a minute. So that bull should be generally vaccinated as a calf, then boosters, and then annually six to eight weeks prior to breeding season. So we've really got the immunity built up. Um, we just talked about IBR and BBD being two big players in reproductive disease, uh, also in pneumonia. So using those, once again, work with your veterinarian to see if you might need a modified live or you need a kill. Uh, lepto, once again, work with your vet. If you're using Spirovac, in my opinion, you can get away with fewer in a year. Um, if you're really having issues, you may have to go twice a year. Uh, but most recommend once a year with the uh, the Spirovac. But if you're using that that L5 or 5-way, some people call it, um, yeah, you're probably going to have to use it multiple times a year. And then consult with your vet and see if Trick and Vibrio is even necessary in your herd. Um, when I first got here, Charlie Hatcher, Dr. Charlie Hatcher was the state veterinarian. And there were a couple of cases of trichomoniasis that popped up in middle Tennessee. And I was accused of bringing it here. So I'd have something to do. Uh, but, uh, he, he charged us with doing a study to find the prevalence rate in the state of Tennessee. Should we, uh, you know, press the panic button. And, uh, we, we did a study and we were expecting to find 3% because that's, what our surrounding states have. Uh, no, we didn't find 3%. We found three, three total bulls, not 3%. Um, we, there has been um, other bulls found since then, but it's been few and far between. Just a handful of bulls. And of course, quick as they're found, it was jumped on, tended too quickly. And then of course, we've got the state regulation. So in my opinion, I think we're keeping it well regulated. And something else I think that's a, a big help with controlling trichomoniasis in our state, in the state of Tennessee, is our average herd size is about 30. Uh, trick tends to be a disease that shows up in large herds, uh, especially herds out west that are open range herds where these animals can mix together. So we've got a couple of uh, advantages here in the state that helps us keep trick under control. And can't be under control as well. All right. Any questions before we move on to BSEs? I see the chat board is nothing there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to BSE. Once again, you can enter a question at any time.
Okay, my little message says y'all can see my participation, but I just want to make sure you are seeing my my screen. Yep, we can see it. Awesome, cool. Thank you. All righty. BSE. Man, this is cool. I get to talk. I, I am a theriogenologist by training. Uh, I did my training under two individuals that did quite a bit of male reproductive physiology. And so this is my formal training. I'm usually talking about health-related topics. But now I get to talk about something that I actually really love to do. I like doing the health stuff, but I am more so into reproduction. I really enjoy talking about reproductive uh, topics. Um, I realize there's quite a few individuals in the department that are reproductive physiologists, so they typically talk about it, and I don't. Uh, but cool, we get to talk about BSEs. So first thing, uh, this is just something I did this talk at. Uh, Northeast T B uh, Northeast Tennessee B uh, Golly can't even talk y'all uh, the Expo Day and they had just asked me to do this on why does my bull fail why why is that bull and I just came up with a couple of things here that I typically hear all the time uh, Doc I just found a cow dead in my pasture what happened uh, once again I broke my crystal ball I don't know number two. I do a two-hour repro talk, and the first question, Doc, what's the best thing for pink eye? And number three, Doc, remember that bull, you failed? And I often come back real quick and say, uh, no, actually, I did not fail that bull. The bull failed himself. If he had given me the right sample, the right morphology, exactly the same way, I guarantee you, one of you either made this comment back in high school or you heard somebody make this comment. Well, doggone, that teacher failed me on that test. No, the teacher didn't fail you. You wrote the wrong answers down. No, I didn't fail the bull. The bull failed himself. I'm just counting the cells and telling you exactly what that bull has. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go through some of the portions of a BSE, and I'm going to go over the reasons why these bulls fail these exams. Number one, the male tends to be ignored, but he is responsible for most of the gen uh, genetic progress in your herd. I often get this, Doc, I got cows that are not getting pregnant. What do you think's wrong with my cows? Well, your cows are probably okay. It's probably your bull. Uh, they're responsible for 50% of the mating success. Let me get my pointer going here. I got I can't talk without my pointer. There may be reasons here, but that bull cannot make intromission. So we need to look at all these things. All right. The mission of a veterinary bull uh, soundness exam. I want to find that subfertile individual. He's going to impact cell weights, long-term negative effects on the herd's fertility beyond, uh, beyond that current generation of cows. So I got a slide here that looks at what subfertility actually does. And this is a very true statement right here. Sterility is extremely rare. About 30% of bulls are subfertile. These bulls. Uh, let me back up. Sorry. My mentor. Also, we have done the same exact study. And I have found other papers that look at, well, just how many bulls are actually subfertile. All of these papers, ours included, find that approximately 30% of bulls out there are subfertile. So when you go into having your bulls tested, just have this mindset. Not everybody's going to pass. There are going to be some subfertile bulls there. And that's the whole idea of this BSE is to pick out that bull that is subfertile that is going to cost you money. 
those subfertiles are producing less pregnancies. And let's just kind of look in right here at pregnancy rates. First 21 days, those fertile bulls are getting 60% more pregnant. 21 days here, about the same. But you will notice here, he's starting to catch up way on out here. This is the normal distribution I would expect with a fertile bull. He's getting most of them pregnant right off the bat. Then a few more, then a few more. But then you can see out here at the very end, total calves born. He's going to be putting more calves on the ground. Oh, let me back. Oh, well, I can do it right here. Notice, based on a 63-day breeding season, I strongly encourage you, if you're not on a defined calving season or defined breeding season, to work your way into it. We have materials, training materials, that if you're not on it, you want to get into a defined calving season, we can help you do it. Don't do it all at one lick. You're going to, oh my, it's going to cost you calves. You can do it slowly over a couple of three years and get into a defined breeding season because now you're going to be able to do everything at once. You're going to be able to constantly trade your labor around a, a couple of times a year. You're going to be able to do all your vaccines at one time. You're going to be able to do uh, all your uh, castration, uh, dehorning if necessary. You can do all that one time and you can market your calves as in get a better premium out of your calves, not just take what you can get at the sale barn. I'm sorry if anybody from sale barns here, uh, you're taking your chances at sale barn, what somebody's going to give you. If you've got a uniform set of calves, you can market that set of calves. And this, this is a talk that Andrew Griffith gives about marketing calves. And so uh, Andrew's much sharper on economics than I am but still a defined calving season. So let's look at something here. Look at our fertile bull. I want you to notice something here. How much more pounds of calves he's giving you than a subfertile calf. Don't pay any attention to the numbers. These numbers are old. I am literally looking at pounds of calves. So look, almost 9,000 pounds, well, a little over 9,000 pounds that you're extra that you're able to sell with a fertile bull. Will that subfertile bull eventually get calves pregnant? Yes, he will. Eventually. But you're not going to have a nice uniform group of calves. All righty. Mating success. And these are the factors here. And this is what I'm looking at when I am looking at this bull. Scrotal circumference. He, needs to, he has a certain size criteria he's got to meet. And that's important, too, as far as his offspring as well. And, of course, how many cows he can mate. Also, that scrotal circumference has something to do with the fertility of his daughters. The larger his scrotal circumference, the quicker his daughters come into puberty. I will have a bull that comes in, and he is either barely just making scrotal, or he's not there. I mean, he's like within one centimeter or two centimeters from making it that producer will ask me doc can i still use him sure go right ahead but you're shooting yourself in the foot because you are affecting his offspring and you're probably having a smaller calf crop i look at a percent normal spermatozoa he's got to have 70 to make it modal spermatozoa he's got to have at least 30 percent this is one that I swore to myself, the next time I give the BSC talk, I'm going to hammer this one home. And I hope everybody catches this one. So if you're not paying attention, you're taking a nap, wake up now, turn off the TV, quit playing on your phone. I can say that because I do that during Zoom meetings too. Pay attention right here. I will have bulls that are subfertile. They don't make it. They, they don't pass the BSC. And the first thing that the producer will say to me, well, what was his motility, Doc? What was it? As in, that's the most important thing. No, it's not. He only needs 30% modal spermatozoa to pass. But he's got to have 70% normal morphologic to pass. That's the important part. 
he can still swim and get there with just 30 percent to the old site but he's got to have more normal spermatozoa to increase the chances of getting through the old site and resulting in a pregnancy so this is the most important part his motility i've i've let me think just a second. I've been doing it 30 years. I think I've only ever failed one on motility, and that was a ram. It, it was not a bull. I don't know that I've ever seen a bull that did not pass motility. Of course, normal reproductive anatomy, sheath, penis, testicles, also internal organs. I examine all of those. Also, general health. Is that bull in good health? My mentor used to say, sex is a luxury. If something else is ha going on, something else is happening, sex ain't happening. So if he's feeling bad, uh, high fever, pneumonia, lameness, um, he stove up, he can't walk. He, he, he can't get semen to the cow. He can't get to where it's going. So I got to look at all those things when I do that exam. Also, body condition score. Uh, he has two brains. He's got one between his ears and he got one between his legs. Come breeding season, that between his ears goes away. He is more concerned about breeding cows than he is about maintaining his body condition, just like a football player. We want a football player well stocked up going into season. So if he is not uh, in good health, good body condition, he's not going to breed cows. Having a look in his penis here and making sure he can get semen where it's got to be. He's going to make intromission. I showed you a picture there of a, that's called a persistent frenulum. Uh, he can't make intromission there. I'm, I got other pictures here. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Uh, there may be some failure to extend because of those defects that I'm talking about. He also can have adhesions where he got a scar. Uh, something of that nature and formed an adhesion. He's not able to extend anymore. And there's also inexperience. Every once in a while we'll run into a bull that um, I call it juvenility. He just kind of simply doesn't know what to do. Um, I will say that the BSE does not test that. It does not test this bull's libido. So we have to, sometimes we have to watch these bulls to make sure they're mounting cows and they're making intermission. Here's some of those defects that will prevent breeding. Here's warts. Here's that persistent frenulum again. Uh, this is um, thymosis. He's got an adhesion right here. He cannot extend his penis. This is where he had a hair ring, and it's literally cut the end of his penis off, almost off anyway. Acts like a constrictor band. This is a filling defect. When a bull gets an erection, he has to have uh, – be able to block blood flow into his penis and it stays there so he can maintain an erection. If he has a shunt, a shunt is where blood flow bypasses an organism or an organ or a certain region of the body. If he's got a shunt, he cannot get an erection. This is literally where it's called a rainbow filling defect. And you can see here, uh, it looks like a rainbow. And, um, I put this picture in here just to show that I don't steal pictures off the internet. This is a bull that I examined and you can see here warts and he isn't, he even has a set of warts right here on his glands penis. Of course, this bull was immediately removed from the, uh, from the test, uh, from, he was uh, considered, uh, uh, sorry, unsatisfactory. I blanked there for just a second. Unsatisfactory. Um, if you want to have your veterinarian try to remove these things, go right ahead. But uh, this can easily form scars and adhesions. And once again, if you see this area of his penis right here, the glands penis has all these warts on it. And I'm not even sure what that white area is. Uh, I saw that and I was really puzzled. I'm not sure what that is. The only way I'd have to be, know what that is is testing, but it could be more warts. Uh, once again, this is going to take in, uh, innervation away from the end of his penis, and he's not going to be able to feel where he needs to go so he can't make intromission. Uh, this is a penile hematoma. Uh, this, and, of course, on a light-colored animal, you can see this bruising, but on a 
uh, Angus, you're not going to see this, or a black, black hided animal. You're not going to see it. You can also see his sheath here. His prepuce also looks discolored from the bruising here. And a lot of times what happens here is this bull will get sloppy going in, going into the late breeding season and he'll miss. You may have heard it called broken penis. The bull does not gain, when he gets an erection, he does not gain size of diameter or length. He just simply gets an erection. And he's got a very tough structure there called the tunica albuginea that holds all that pressure in uh, that area of his penis so he can get an erection. Well, then he's got, it's like, it's like five, 6,000 pounds per square inch inside his penis. And then you got 2,000 pounds making a breeding lunge into the cow. Well, if he misses that tunica albuginea can rupture, uh, very similar if we're putting too much air into a tire, it'll rupture. And where that area ruptures is right back here in front of his scrotum. Here's his scrotum right here. So if you see a big swelling or light hided animal and you see bruising right there in front of the scrotum, good possibility he's got penile hematoma. And, and sometimes you can see the prepuce looking like an elephant's trunk. That's what that reminds me of there because of the edema that's going on and he'll extend and it looks like an elephant's trunk. That can be repaired, but your bull has to be awfully uh, expensive to go through that surgery. Here's some more congenital defects. I didn't just steal pictures. Uh, I found these right here. You can see right here. This is uh, one that I found early on when I was here. Here's another one right here where that persistent frenulum attaches. Now, I can repair that. I can take suture and ligate it on both ends and clip that off. But this is considered heritable, and, and there's actually been testing done, and it is heritable. Um, it's got a 30% penetrance rate. And if you want to pursue that even further, Dr. Troy or Owens, who you need to talk to, I am not, I, I, I flat out just do not know genetics. But Dr. Troy Rowan can explain all about that penetration rate of, of being passed on to his offspring. So if you're saving bulls out of him, there's a potential that his bulls will have this as well. And some of his daughters could potentially pass it on to their bulls. So if it's a seed stock animal that, that this animal is being used for, I generally recommend, no, cull him. But if you're using him for terminal cross calves, yeah, I'll let you get by. I'll repair it right quick. And that bull is just used for terminal crosses because, of course, you're not going to use those for any sort of breeding program. Okay, let's move on to the accessory sex glands. Those are examined as well. He possesses the full content of accessory sex glands. The purpose of those glands is to provide those little merchant marines with Nutrients to get to where they're going. They've got a long uh, process, a long hike that they got to take to get to the old site. It'd be similar to if you're going to the field to work for the day in the hay field or something like that. You take water with you. You're probably going to take some snacks with you, that kind of thing. So you can maintain hydration and everything else along the way. Same thing. That's what these, organ these uh, uh, sex glands do is they provide Nutrition to those little merchant marines as they're moving along. And this is the one that's most commonly infected uh, in the bull. And, and this is just a picture here where the track was removed and these vesicular glands are swollen and infected. Uh, this, this can be treated. Younger bulls tend to be able to get rid of it on their own. Uh, older bulls tend to be chronically infected. You can't get rid of it, uh, but it can be treated with Draxin. I'm going to check out the Q and answer box here real quick. Okay. Let's answer some of these questions just real fast. Okay. What natural service conception rate is expected anywhere, anywhere from 80 to 90%, but it can be breed uh, dependent. There you go. If it's less than that 60, 70%, uh, I'm, I'm going to get that bull tested. But here's actually what I'm going to recommend that you do. 
you have that bull tested before every breeding season. I do not care if he passed his breeding soundness exam last year. That don't mean Jack Diddley squat this year. Something could have happened to him in the meantime, and he's no longer good. I apologize, y'all. I got to get an extension cord and plug up my computer. Battery's going to run out. I'll be right back. Okay, there we go. What age is too young to get an accurate BSE? I test bulls at the bull test station at around 12 to 13 months all the time. Uh, and that, remember, that 20 to 30% fail rate that you're going to see? Uh, very, very similar there. So in my opinion, if you're at least 12 to 13 months of age, that bull is going to be close enough to maturity. He's good to go. Something else that you can look at, too, with scrotal circumference. Scrotal circumference can also be an indicator of maturity uh, more so than his age. Now, we push scrotal circumference awfully hard. I like to see them in the 36 to 37 range, 35, 36, 37. That's a good range there. If I see a young bull 12 to 13 months of age and he's got a 44 and I have seen that, uh, there's usually something wrong with that bull. Uh, some will mature just a little bit later. Once again, breed dependent. If it's a boss Taurus type bull, they tend to mature a little quicker. Boss Indicus tends to be a little later. So uh, it's kind of breed dependent, but kind of in that 12, 13, 14 months of age. What's the best time to test a bull for spring breeding timing wise? Uh, here's what I also like to tell the students, especially when I'm teaching this, but I tell this to owners as well. Whatever your breeding season is, I don't care what your breeding season is, whether it's fall, spring, whenever, get your bull tested at least two months ahead of breeding season. That way, let me. I'm sorry, let me back up. Here's why I want you to do that. If a, a bull takes two months to create a brand new set of spermatozoa, it's sort of like uh, high school students. You got freshmen, sophomore, senior, uh, junior, seniors. Same thing. Uh, they start early, and the, but they've got to mature. So it takes four years to get out of high school. It takes two months for a set of spermatozoa to start forming and then be mature enough to where they can fertilize an oil site. So two months ahead of breeding season, that way, if that bull does not make it, he fails, you've got two months in which you've got time to locate another bull. Or if I see a condition I feel like is treatable, I've got two months to treat that bull and then get him going again and do another BSC to see if he's ready to go. Bring calf and not breed. Okay, same thing. Great. Uh, Ke Ke uh, Kelly, I wish I could answer that with some sort of halfway intelligent answer where you have 17 female to three male. Uh, all I got to say is don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, I really wished I could answer that. I was in dairy business for 25 years. Um, and we saw that same thing. We would have runs of heifers, which of course, that's what we wanted. We needed replacement females, but then we would have a run of bulls and well, doggone, there you go. Not a lot I can do with a Jersey bull. So uh, I do not have a rhyme or reason. If I could answer that question, uh, I probably would, um, be rich enough that I wouldn't even be talking to y'all tonight. 
Okay. What is preferred scrotal circumference size? Uh, we just haven't quite gotten there. Uh, it, well, I've got it in here, but it, it is a, we've got a set of standards I got to meet. And we did just grab it out our space. Studies have been done looking at grams of testicular tissue to per, per, produce an amount of spermatozoa. And it actually differs between a boss taurus and a boss indicus. And there is a standard for boss indicus and a standard for boss taurus. The, the way that I remember it, and this is the easy way to remember scrotal circumference. At 15 months, he's got to be 30 centimeters. That's easy to remember. At 24 months of age, he's got to be 34 centimeters. Once again, that's easy to remember. If it falls in between there, uh, I ain't going to lie. I've got to go look myself. I have to look on the chart to see exactly what it is in between there. But because we push scrotal circumference so hard, uh, a lot of times on these bulls, they come into the bull test. These rascals are 12 months of age and they're passing for a two-year-old bull. So um, rarely, rarely do I find a bull that does not make it on scrotal circumference. And what was the percent normal spermatozoa? 70% and 30% modal. Once again, that is scientifically based. That is not just reaching out there in space and grabbing numbers. Research was done where they took cows, different sets of cows, in a defined breeding season, 60 days, and then they stuck bulls with them. Then they came back and did pregnancy exams on the cows. Then did BSEs on the bulls. That seems backwards, right? Well, they were doing that just to make the decision on what bulls are actually good. Those bulls that got cows pregnant in a efficient manner within that 60 to, uh, I think it was 60, 65 day breeding season were the ones that had a bare minimum of 70 normal spermatozoa and 30% modal. Now, that doesn't mean that a bull that's 90 and 90% 90 morphology and 50% motility uh is not the same as that 70-30. He'll get cow. He's even more efficient. What I'm saying there is that 70-30 is the bare minimum he's got to be. And I often tell, ask vet students when I'm talking to them about this, uh, what do you call a vet student that graduates with a C? Uh, you call them doctor. So uh, that C is enough to make it. That 70-30 is enough to make it. Okay, what is the effect of using multiple sires on breeding rates? We typically run at least one bull per 15 cows, so we end up with three or four for 60 cows. Wow, you got like, like way too many bulls. What I typically do with a bull battery or bulls in general, I get this question all the time, how many cows do I need to stick with my one bull? So here's what I do. Just kind of a rough rule of thumb. I take the bull's age in months, and that's how many cows he can be with. So tw 20 months of age, he can be with 20 cows. When that bull reaches full maturity, he's usually going to have a scrotum in the range of 45-ish, 44. And that's usually where I'll say one bull can keep up with at least one mature bull can keep up with at least 40 cows. So, um, and I do not go, okay, well, I got two bulls at 40, that's 80 cows. No, usually I just do one and a half. So we got one bull and then another half a bull. So instead of uh, saying those two bulls can keep up with 80, I would say those two bulls could keep up with in the neighborhood of 65 to 70, okay? Lepto is just for cows. Give it to steer. I don't give it to a steer because a steer is not a breeding animal. Lepto is a breeding disease. So I don't have to worry about giving it to a steer. But yes, bulls, I have to give it to a bull. Because once again, that is a breeding disease. He can pass it venerally on to the next animal. He can pick it up from a cow. That steer can too, but it don't matter. That steer is not doing any breeding, so it doesn't matter whatsoever on the steer. But on the bull, oh my yes.
uh, lepto, and I think I said it in the uh, the health section there. Do testing and see which one you got. Work with your veterinarian to see which one is needed. It can differ in different areas. It also depends. Do you have carrier cows? If you got carrier cows, you're going to have Harjo bovis. If you've got the incidentals, that's going to be brought in by other species, wild pigs, dogs, um, uh, rodents, those type things. So do testing to see which one you need. Uh, pull blood, send it off, have your veterinarian help you with that. You can do it on your own, but I recommend you have a veterinarian to help you with it so that veterinarian can help make recommendations. At what age should bulls start breeding? Uh, they reach maturity at about age. Um, they actually reach maturity at about 10 to 11 months, but they're not. most bulls are not tall enough at that stage to reach cows. So uh, I like for them to be out there 13, 14-ish months, that kind of thing. If you buy a herd as a first-time farmer, do you automatically get them tested? Get who tested? The bull? The cows? If you don't have less than a certain percent get pregnant uh, um, I, I'm going to recommend if you're buying a herd or buying new animals uh, get stuff tested uh, so you have a baseline so you'll know what you're dealing with the uh, cord lab that I talked about a while ago charges you zero for testing I'm going to say that again zero for testing man you can't beat that deal have them tested uh, get your veterinarian involved to help make decisions. You don't have to make these decisions all by yourself. Uh, sure, you can make that decision by yourself uh, if, if you've got an, a, a much better educated decision from a an extension agent or a veterinarian, uh, much better, and it's going to be worth the money that you pay for that vet to come out. And, of course, your extension agent is going to help you just because that's what we do. You have a rare genetic bull. Will you still collect and use if a subsperm producer? No. Uh-uh. If he's subfertile, why would I keep him? He's not getting animals pregnant. There's way too much good genetics out there. This one's still this is another one van that drives me nuts. I have people, producers that will bring me bulls. They'll, they've saved them around. And they say, this bull is from Rito, uh, still the, the old 90s genetic Rito. And I'm going, golly bum. Oh, really? You want to keep that around? The Ritos that I remember usually were hunting human rectums. They were tear fences down. Oh, they were bad. And I'm just going, why would you keep that genetics around? There's way too many much better genetics out there available now. Why would you? Want to keep old genetics around. That's just my opinion. I, I would not. No. No. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Anonymous. No carrier cows or incidentals. Uh, I don't know if that's a statement or a question. No, I'm, I'm guessing you don't have carrier cows or incidentals. Awesome. That, that is awesome if you're able to keep clean that way. That's awesome. Uh, usually pretty difficult to not have incidentals coming in, uh, especially with wildlife. But that's great if you don't have any of either. That's awesome. Some farms turn their cows in with a cleanup bull the day of AI breeding. Um, is there a chance that a cow would have gotten pregnant with AI bull when they still get pregnant with a cleanup bull? Uh, we pay a lot to use the best AI bulls we can find. We hate for AI. So. Okay, here's what I recommend if you're going to do AI and then a cleanup bull. I'm going to AI, and then I'm not going to turn that cleanup bull in until later. Uh, there is a condition called, oh, and I always get those some mixed up, super fecundation, where you can have um, uh, actually a mix of the two. And I'm kind of just going, no, let's don't do that. Um, I generally like, if you're using, sure enough, good AI bulls, I would recommend waiting for a short period of time there so i've got my ai that i've done i'm going to wait at least one heat cycle to then put the cleanup bull in there so when you come back later and you're doing your uh preg test your preg checks you can then know 
if this is an AIK or this is a cleanup bull K. Just the way I like to do it, that's me. Some people do it differently, but if I'm spending a bunch of money on AI semen, I'm going to do it in the way, there you go, Dar Darren, Darren answered the question for me. There you go. Uh, if I'm spending a bunch of money on AI, I want to know the difference. So which left though? Uh, anonymous do testing to see what which one you got. Kenneth, our lab here in the state of Tennessee is CORD, K-O-R-D, State Diagnostic Lab. All you got to do is go on to Google, type in K-O-R-D lab, and it should be the first thing that pops up. Uh, there will be a little selection box on the left-hand side that shows you lab submission guide, how to submit things. There'll be other lab submission forms that you can click on. Uh, if you go to that lab submission guide, it'll actually show exactly what all diseases are tested for at the cord lab. Once again, you can do these samples yourself. These are your cows. You can collect all the samples on them you want to. Uh, just don't run out there and start collecting samples for your neighbor. Now you're, now you're delving into uh, practicing veterinary medicine without a license. Uh, but you can collect all the samples you want to on your animals, send those in on your own, and you'll get the results back. But here's what here's what I highly recommend, and this is what Cord Lab wants to. They want a veterinarian's name tied to that sample so that when the results come back out, that veterinarian can assist you in coming up with a game plan for biosecurity, for vaccination, for treatment, culling decisions, those type things on being able to decide what to do based upon those results that come back. And y'all, sometimes I'm not saying anything about anybody's intelligence. Sometimes they send words back on those lab forms that I have to go look up, okay? So uh, get a veterinarian involved. If we have no carry cows or incidentals, which lepto do we give? None. If you don't have left on your farm, you've tested, it ain't there. Don't vaccinate for it. Why, why bother? Uh, if you don't have a cough, do you run out and take cough medicine? Uh, if it's not there, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, more power to you. And that's awesome, Crystal. If you do not have lepto in any of your cows, that's awesome. You've done a great job of biosecurity or you're awfully lucky. Uh, but if you don't have it, it's not a problem. Don't run out and grab the vaccine. I often tell producers, if you don't have scours on your farm, don't run out and grab the vaccine and start using it. Only use a vaccine or a certain practice to uh, uh, control things if you have it. If you don't have it, I I'm not going to reach for that vaccine. Okay. I think... I got all the questions answered. I'll pause just a minute if anybody else wants to type one in there. These are great questions. Thank you for asking those. I usually get crickets. So thank you very much for participating. Triangle 10 is a good vaccine to use. Yes. Once again, Work with your veterinarian to see what is exactly needed. Triangle 10 is a killed vaccine. i perfectly fine with it. Good vaccine. Uh, I recommend it. It's awesome. Uh, vaccines are preventative. Um, they are not curative. Vaccines prevent animals from getting disease. The one that I did mention there earlier, the Campylobacter, uh, it, it is reported as being curative. It will treat the disease and help get rid of it. Uh, most vaccines are, almost all vaccines are preventative. Okay, once again, if you don't have the exposure, why bother? But that's kind of the way I look at it. That's why I tell you to work with your veterinarian to see what's needed in your area. I'm the kind that if I don't have scours i don't worry about reaching for a scours vaccine um that's, that's that is just my my opinion if you don't have the exposure 
Why should I reach for that vaccine? Vaccines are, they are preventative, but it's also based on a, uh, a risk to exposure basis. If you don't have that exposure, there you go. Okay, uh, I, I think I got all the questions. I think I got them all. Uh, if I didn't, please somebody put it back in there. I'll put it back in there. I just went down the list, but it kept jumping. It kept telling, I kept seeing questions there that I know I uh, scrolled down, but I didn't see it at the time. And I got to the bottom one there. Then I looked back up and went, oh, I didn't answer that question. So if you have another one, please put it back in the box. I'm going to keep going. Uh, but you're more than welcome to answer, uh, excuse me, ask more questions. Here we go. Uh, here's, I just answered this question. Um, we measure, they've got to meet a certain standard. Here's that standard. I talked about it just a little while ago. So no need to go over that one again. Puberty, we talked about this as well. Puberty is actually measured better by scrotal circumference than it is by his age. So uh, I wonder about this one right here. If that bull is not, how do I say it? If he is still showing me immaturity in his spermatozoa, that kind of makes me go, okay, if he's not maturing fast and he matures later on, I'm going to say if he's not mature by 13 months, but it takes him out there to 15, 16, 17 months to reach maturity, What's, that, what's going to happen with his daughters? Uh, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. But that's one uh, that, that I've always wondered about. If that takes that bull longer to reach puberty, does it take his daughters longer to reach puberty? Usually that ejaculate is going to have about 3 to 15 cc's. It's going to be kind of creamy white uh, looking right here. Now, if it's watery, red, blood, pus, and I'm, that's what I'm showing right here. This is a bull that I collected, and he had vesiculitis. And this is pus. These are white blood cells that settled to the bottom. So that's bad. That's a bad deal. I've got to treat that bull. And Draxin usually can be treated with Draxin. And I was just showing you here right here, the semen can be yellow. That's okay. Their diet can cause the semen to be yellow. No big deal. And I'm just showing you comparing it to that magazine, how it can be yellow. That's my hand right there. All righty, looking at spermatogenesis here, the testicles response to stress, environmental insult is abnormal spermatozoa. So this is a reason why that bull can fail. Also, we can have genetic abnormalities. Uh, let me look at the time here. I don't want to run over too much. Oh, we got 30 minutes. We're, I think we're okay. All right, right here, this goes back to if I had a rare genetic bull the subpar would I keep him? No. Look right here. Genetic abnormalities lead to the production of altered or abnormal spermatozoa. Um, one of them, I'll sh no, I'll wait until I get there. I think I got a picture of one. All right. In the testicle is where spermatogenesis takes place. If I see a head or a midpiece defect, that probably happened in the testicle. If I see a defect, that happen during maturation. Maturation happens in the epididymis. Think about it this way. Think about a car manufacturer. When they build these cars inside the factory, they're, they're assembled together, but then they have to be painted. Well, for you have to wait for the paint to dry. Well, that's kind of similar to what's going on here. The vehicle is painted, excuse me, assembled, and then painted, and then it has to go to an area for the paint to dry. Same thing right here. The, the spermatozoa are made in the testicle, but they are not ready to fertilize cells quick as they come out of the testicle. They then go into the epididymis to mature. So some of the defects that I can see are droplets. Uh, I can fix those pretty easy. These are not hard to fix. These, these up here are hard to fix. That happened in, in, in formation. Also, if I handle the semen badly from collecting it from the bull until I go into the lab, I can cause tail defects. So I've got to be careful with it myself to make sure I'm not causing defects. 
here we go. I've already explained where this came from. That's 70 30. Like I said, this bull is effective. He's not as effective as a 90 50, but he still gets the job done. A lot of environmental insults can cause defects whether that be extreme heat i often worry about the bulls at the bull test because we can have some awfully hot temperatures there in spring hill but we try to keep them cool as much as possible stress is another one heat and stress call well lameness frostbite any of these actually can cause an issue with what's called luteinizing hormone that is released from the anterior pituitary, and it helps with spermatogenesis. If LH is being interfered with, that can easily cause a problem with spermatogenesis, and all of these right here can interfere with LH. When I say poor thermoregulation, there's a reason why the bull's testicles hang. They're pendulous from the body. The, the testicles have to be two to three degrees c celsius cooler than body temperature for spermatogenesis to take place so if he's not able to thermoregulate if he's not able to keep those testicles cooler than body temperature uh, those spermatozoa will be affected a researcher at auburn when i was doing my uh, when i was going through vet schools actually when this happened he did a quick research project on bulls and what he did he <laughs> It's funny, but he made scrotal koozies. His wife literally knitted them together. And they would take these koozies and put them on bull testicles and leave them there. And they saw, the, of course, the testicle could not cool off like it needed to. And they saw defects within about 24 to 36 hours. So that's how easily any of these can cause defects in spermatozoa. Of course, heat. Same thing I just talked about. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory what I just talked about. Stress, the same thing. Here we go. Cortisol is elevated. It affects LH and produce and production of testosterone. LH, which is that luteinizing hormone, also helps with production of testosterone. Testosterone is not being produced. Spermatozoa are not being produced. Once again, lameness. Social status of the bull. Okay, let's go over that real quick. Especially in a multi-sire herd. I've run into this more than once. Y'all all know this. This happens any, we're just like cattle. Cattle are just like us. We all have to develop a social hierarchy. If we were all to meet together in a room tonight and then... Again, on Thursday night, I promise you, a lot of you will be sitting beside the same exact person you were sitting beside in the meeting prior. I often ask granary students, when I see them first year and then I see them third year, are y'all still sitting in the same seat that you were first year? And a lot of them go, yes, because they have to work out their social hierarchies. So do cattle. These bulls especially, some of these bulls will be dominant they will run everybody else off and he will be the only one breeding cows. He's dominant enough and persistent enough. He doesn't let any other bulls breed. Well, what if he's the dead blame subfertile bull? I run into this producer calls me up and they had done preg checks and he had a lot of open cows and he actually had done some study and research and thought he had trichomonasis and her. Hey, buddy, good good thought process because we go and I start looking and sure enough, uh, his clinical signs in his females was fitting that. A lot of open cows, a lot of early pregnancy losses. But come to find out, okay, let's look at your bulls right quick because you had multi-sire herd. And one of the first bulls that runs into the chute is the dominant bull in his bull battery. And he tells me this quick as he comes into the chute. And we do a BSE on him. And sure enough, he's subfertile. So 
uh, bang, here's your, uh, here's your, here's your sign, Vern. In other words, uh, here is the problem. We went ahead and did trichomoniasis testing anyway, just to be sure all the bulls were clean and he rectified the situation with getting rid of that subfertile bull and cows started getting pregnant. So, uh, sometimes it just takes a little bit of CSI, uh, investigation to figure out what's going on. You miss more by not looking than you do by not knowing. All righty, genetic effects. Once again, you want to know more about this progeny testing and genomic testing. You need to talk with Troy Rowan. And we do this kind of thing with the bulls at the bull test station. But I think our genetic problems are going to be picked up a lot more. We're going to see them a lot more through this genomic testing. Once again, you miss more by not looking than you do. Or you miss more by not looking than you do by not knowing. It's less common than environmental, but it's still there. Also, this is another problem that I see quite a bit. Um, basically, got closing your eyes and turning your head. Uh, we don't know that we, we got something, so let's just not test for it. And then, of course, it's more common than toxic causes. I don't see a whole lot of toxic causes of spermatogenesis. All right? And then we talked about this, so I'm going to move on from that. Here is one of the... Uh, defects that we can see, and I like to point these out to owners when they're standing over my shoulder watching my screen. I've got a, I've got a uh, scope that has a computer screen on it. Man, it is nice because I can teach students and I can show owners what the defects are. But this is a proximal droplet. This can be age-related, juvenility, released too soon. What happens is this spermatozoa, when he's being made in the testicle, he has a layer of cytoplasma all over him, just like you wear in a coat or like a snake with a skin. The snake sheds a skin every year. This spermatozoa, when he's being made and maturates, does the same thing. He sheds that skin, and this is a where the cytoplasma is shedding, and, it's, and he was released too early. This will not get a cell fertilized. It will not get a cow pregnant. And I, and I need to go over that real quick, too. i got time. The reason we do this, the reason I've got an $8,000 microscope, one teaching and one to show uh, people what the defects are, but also to understand what these defects are, I want to make sure that there's enough there to get that cell fertilized properly and you're not losing a calf crop. I know, I know of individuals that will simply take a drop of raw semen on a slide Stick it underneath the scope. It's moving. He's good. Let's do another one. And they never look at morphology. Once again, morphology is the most important part of this exam because it shows us that that cell is capable of penetrating through an old site and potentially causing fertilization. This cell right here will not cause fertilization. The And I often tell young male veterinary students this, and animal science students this. The quicker you realize that women actually control the world, the better off you'll be because the old site controls fertilization. If she sees a bad cell like this gets in, she says, eh, ball game's over. I'm coming back into heat 21 days later. Also, if one of these bad ones gets in there first, she also has what's called zona block because if two cells get into the old site, that's called polyspermia, and she stops right then and there. And ball game's over. I'm coming back into heat 21 days later. So we want to make sure that a good guy is getting in there first before these bad guys. All right, misshapen heads. Once again, that cell realizes this. This, this cell right here can have just as good a motility as a good one, and they can also get pushed along with each other. If he gets in first, she says, nope, ain't happening. This can be through thermal, thermal regulation. It can be endocrine, just, we are unknown. Usually if I see a high number of head defects, uh, that bull ain't getting better. Ah, oh, I do have it right here. This is very similar to that question that was asked a while ago. If I have a bull of... 
unusual genetic potential. But he's subfertile. Do I save him? Here is a prime example of that very same question. We like to use acronyms in veterinary medicine, but this is not an acronym. DAG was a Jersey Danish bull. He was supposed to be, his genetics was supposed to be the next best thing since sliced bread. However, look at this arrow, the yellow arrow right here. This reminds me of a lady that take, has long hair and she puts it in a bun on top of her head. This is the genetic defect that this dag bull had. Just guess how many cows he was able to get pregnant. This defect can show up in other cattle as well. It's a genetic defect. It is passed along to his offspring. I see one or two. I don't think too much about it. If I see a bull that has a high number of these, and when I say high number, I'm just going to say 20%, I will highly advise to that producer to not use this bull because of those genetic defects. Notice right here, bulls with normal fertility, you rarely see more than 5% in that. But bulls with impaired fertility, and this is a mid-piece defect. This happens in formation, and it is genetic. I highly, if, that, if it's 20%, even though he's got 80% normal cells, I highly recommend not to use that bull. And here's just a mixture. We've got a mixture of everything right here. But here's a bull that I, I, I literally just told the owners, do not use this bull, but I can't force him. I, I I made him an unsatisfactory breeder, but right here, look, here's one, here's two, here's three, four, five, six, seven, seven in one slide. That's just one view. I make multiple views when I count these. I count 100 cells total. So look how many he's already got. He's already got more than 7%. Plus he's got proximal droplets. This bull had problems. He's got head defects right here that this is an excellent teaching slide because it's got everything on it all right here's a dag like defect notice it's very very similar once again it falls into the mid-piece abnormality heritable i recommend this bull not be used once again knobbed acrosome here's a misshapen head it looks like he's a flat top he loves to go in and get his hair what they call it in the, in the uh, military, high and tight, high and tight right here. He gets that, he gets shaved off. He cannot penetrate an old site. He cannot penetrate that membrane around the old site. Genetic, get rid of him. Here's distal midpiece. Now I can get rid of this one. This is one that happens in the epididymis. This is where... And it's called distal midpiece for a reason. Here's the midpiece right here. And it flips around and goes backwards. When I watch one of these swim during motility, he swims backwards. So, of course, he's going the wrong direction anyway. This happens during, uh, good gracious, I'm sorry, maturation. A lot of times it's because he's set in the epididymis too long. I, I can fix this one. I can go back out there and collect him, let some hit the floor, and I usually can clean these up. Notice I said usually. Uh, what caused it? Temperature, stress, but it happens in the epididymis. Detached head. This is another one that happens in the epididymis. Uh, we call it a rusty load where he just sat in the epididymis too long. So I can fix this one real easy too. I just go back out there, collect him, let a bunch hit the floor and then catch it. It usually corrects it right away. Distal droplet. Uh, we used to call this a defect. We no longer call this a defect. We do research for a reason. So we can learn that what we've said all these years was actually the wrong thing. Uh, this is nothing but that proximal drop that, that's now moved distal. He is just about to shuck that off. He's about to shed it. We have learned through research now that he swims around for about five minutes. He shucks it off. He goes on and does the job like he's supposed to if he has a normal head. So I don't worry about these. I can fix these pretty easy. 
So I no longer call this one a defect, but I just wanted to show you that. Terminally coiled tail. Notice it's way on out there on the terminal piece. They coil up. This reminds me of my sister back in the 60s. And some of you probably remember that or know somebody that did it or you did it yourself. Your, your wife did it or something. They would curl their hair with orange cans, those orange juice, those concentrated orange juice cans is how they would curl their hair. That's what it reminds me of. And this can be through heat stress. Notice I got a question here about Gossipol. Um, we think a little bit differently about Gossipol. For years, we said Gossipol in bulls, that's bad. But actually, they've improved these types of gossipol and cottonseed now. So you have to feed like a gobo bazillion buttload of cottonseed to actually cause problems from gossipol. Also, I can cause this with stain too. If my stain is hyperosmotic, I can cause that tail to curl up or I can cause the entire midpiece and tail to coil up. So if I see a bunch of these on a slide, I'll go, okay, and then I do another bull, and I see the same exact thing. I'm going to go, uh-oh, my stain's ruined. I need to go get a new stain. All righty. Here is that same thing. I'm going to point out who originally did the study. Originally, James Wenzel and Robert Carson. Robert Carson, Dr. Bob Carson was my mentor going through my residency. Dr. Wenzel was also there as well. He was one of the other theriogenologists there in the department at Auburn. They did the original study. Oh, I, I actually think they did it before I was even in vet school. And they found that about 20 to 30% uh, did not pass. And they repeated it. Here's a repeat. But also in that initial study, in our study test too, the same exact study we did, others, they found the same exact thing. 20 to 30% are not going to make it. And right here, unacceptable morphology was by far the most common reason for a bull to be unsatisfactory over all time periods on these BSC forms, on these BSC exams. So uh, it is extremely rare for lameness, uh, scrotal circumference, blindness. The bull's blind in one eye. I can't pass him on a BSC test uh, because he's got to be able to observe those cows riding each other to know who's in heat, to know when there's a sexually active group. Those are by far the lesser. Morphology is over 90% of the reason why bulls do not pass a, a, uh, a BSE. And this is what I see at the bull test station as well. Numbers are very, very similar. Sometimes I've had as low as 15% fail, but then as others, I've had times as high as 22, 25% fail. It kind of comes and goes in patterns. If I could tell you why, once again, I probably would be making so much money. I probably wouldn't be. I'd be on a beach in Florida somewhere or something. I could be retired. I really wished I could tell you why. And I really wished I could tell you what you can do to fix it. Uh, but I can't. Uh, once again, I wished I knew a way to tell you to fix it. Fix that morphology. Sometimes I can. Sometimes that morphology is because he had a bad fever 60 days ago. I can fix that. He'll get better on his own. But in 20 to 30% of these bulls, they're just bad. There's nothing I can do to fix them. So once again, have that mindset. If you're a bull, uh, you, you raise bulls for seed stock, 20 to 30% are not going to make it. And of course, that uh, task force, I was on this task force to develop a new guide for the BSC. I like what we did. Uh, we changed it from primary and secondary defects to head, mid-piece, and tail defects. In my, in my opinion, and this, is, and this was, of course, the opinion of everybody else, or this wouldn't be accepted uh, by this new task force, uh, it was a method of, number one, creating a more uniform count between veterinarians, and number two, 
to uh, easier way to show you what's wrong with that bull. Uh, if I said there's a primary defect, first thing is going to come out of your mouth. Well, what's a primary defect, Doc? And then I got to sit there and explain it. Or if I go, oh, hey, there's a head defect. And you go, golly, Doc, I can see that. And I ain't even got to be no theriogenesiologist. So that's why we came up with a new guide. I like it much better myself. It makes counting easier. And that blue box just told you the same thing that, uh, that I did. And, of course, we're changing it. That's just explaining what I just told you about. Here's two that we changed from abnormal to normal. Abaxial tail implantation. This is one right here. Uh, we accepted that as normal in all other breeds, but in bulls, we called it bad. Once again, we've done research, and we found out it actually is not a problem at all. And the distal cytoplasmic droplet, once again, not a problem. We remained at 70%, though. We did not change that. Progressive motility, the way I make a decision on that uh, is I do an individual evaluation. And what I do is I say, okay, we know he's got to at least have 30%, and this is the way I teach students. Okay, look at it. Do I see more or less than 30% actually swimming somewhere with a purpose progressively forward because a lot of times i'll put it up there and the students go oh they're all swimming it's a hundred percent i tell them to look a little closer you'll have some that are swimming in circles some that are swimming backwards some that are just sitting there shivering so i tell them to look is it more or less than 30 percent more okay is it more or less than 50 percent then they'll say more then i'll say oh is it more or less than 70 percent so I kind of help that way, and I look at one spot on the screen and then make a decision. It's subjective as to how many are swimming in and out. Okay, and then right here, the same exact thing, same thing that I said. we got to have 70. Or notice right here, this is going back to that same statement I said a while ago. He needs to have less than 20% of a specific head or mid-piece abnormality. If he has a greater than 20% specific head defect, I'm just going to say that flat top while I go, or that DAG defect. If he has more than 20%, I'm going to strongly encourage you not use that bull. There's just what I just talked about, abaxial implantation. And there's the distal cytoplasmic droplet. We're not worried about those anymore. Uh, there you go. Uh, I, I basically explained that slide to you. I explained that slide to you too. Same thing. So I, limitations of a breeding soundness exam. It is one snapshot in time. It is not a reliable assessment of libido, how interested he is in that cow, and also his mating ability. I do extend his penis to have a look to make sure there's not any defects there, but that doesn't mean that he is going to make intermission. He could have one of those filling defects. I'll never see that with my machine. I cannot create that. I have to do a test mating. So if you watch those cows, excuse me, watch your bull, man, and cows, and if he doesn't make intermission, uh, we need to be looking. Also, here's something else that I need to go over with you real quick. We put a lot of credibility into this BSC form. <laughs> However, do, do y'all know what a tail light guarantee is? A tail a tail light guarantee is I guarantee this to be good until I see the tail lights of your truck leaving my farm. That's what a tail light guarantee is. That BSC form is actually only good for the time of when I see that bull. Once again, I realize we put a lot of credibility in it, but something could happen to that bull between the time he left my practice to the time he gets to your farm. He could have taken a nasty fall on the trailer, hurt his leg, hurt his scrotum, his testicles, he could have contacted a BVD virus and run a high fever the day after I tested him. 
So there's several factors that come in there, and that's why I always say have that bull tested. He might have been good last breeding season. He put almost 100% calves on the ground. That don't mean he's going to do it again this breeding season. Always have him tested before every breeding season at least 60 days. Okay, I'm not. that's the new form. That's the manual. I'm not worried about that. So let's look. I got a couple of more questions up there. Now, I'm also going to pause for y'all to enter questions here. If heat can cause defects in sperm, so producers breeding season done in cooler weather. All right. Now, uh, Adam, this is my opinion. Great point. I am a fall calver. I like my breeding season in the spring. That is just me. And I think it goes back to my days in the dairy industry. We had to have a fall calving season to in order to get higher prices in our milk. So in order to do that, I need all my cows to calve in the, in the fall. So that's the way we bred to have them all in the fall. And so I think it goes back to that. I would rather breed in cooler weather calve in cooler weather even though good gracious alive it was 83 today and i thought it was 95 or 98 uh, when the sun started bearing down on me <coughs> excuse me uh but i would rather breed during a cooler time of year that's just me a lot of people do uh spring calving season so they're breeding in warmer weather a lot of people do that it's all up to you and your operating system i prefer fall if an older bull passes all the tests, how old, in my opinion, is too old for a herd bull. When that bull gets to where he cannot mount cows anymore and keep up with the cows, he's getting too old to keep up with them. Uh, now that bull is too old. In my opinion, here's the way I look at it. Especially if you're saving heifers for replacement animals. Now, if you're selling everybody every year, you can keep that bull for multiple years, of course, as long as he's passing a BSC exam and he's getting cows pregnant, he's keeping up with your cows. But if I am keeping back his heifers, either you're going to have to have a way to separate, his he separate out his heifers or you're going to have some incest going on there. We do not want that bull breeding back to his heifers, his offspring. So uh, I'm looking at every four to five years that bull probably needs to be swapped out and that's what keeping his heifers separated to where he can't breed them because they're going to be breedable within at about 14 to 15 months of age so you're going to need to separate those heifers out where he can't breed his heifers uh but still four to five years is probably the longest i'm going to keep a bull anyway too once again too much good genetics out there to just keep the same genetics every year way too much uh, and uh, I'm going to try to make genetic potential gain in my animals every year. Uh, I, what if the market changes and what I, the genetics that I've got is not producing a desirable animal. Uh, now I'm outdated. The market's changing to where I need the, that new genetics. I'm gaining. Once again, this is a talk for Troy Rowan. He's got a great talk on bull selection for genetics. It's an awesome talk. So highly recommend uh, Y'all get in contact with, with Katie or whoever to get Troy on here to do a genetics talk. Okay, that's the only two that I see there. Any more questions before I go? Uh, I appreciate being able to join by Zoom. And, of course, I see y'all are on, on Zoom, too. Uh, it's really nice to be able to sit here on my back porch and to do this talk and reach out to a wide audience. So any questions? Questions before I go. Anything else, Dale, we need to do? Did I lose everybody? Okay. John, thank you very much. I hope this helped. Oh, real quick. Let's see if I can type. How do I? I'm just going to type in an answer here to Jay. Whoops. Sorry.
Okay, everybody should be able to, I think, see that. I think. Did it pop up there, Adele? My web address? I have a website. Ask Dr. Lou, A S K D R L E W dot Tennessee dot edu. You can go to that website and you can type in a question and it tells me, hey, somebody in uh, Robertson County has a question about their bull and I can email you back. So please feel free to use that. Contact me. Uh, okay, sorry, it's not up, but I, I just told it to you. I wish I had a way of putting it on there. I should have put it on my slide. I apologize. But it is A S K D R L E W. Oh, there we go. Thank you. There's my address right there. I guess I could have put it in the chat box. I should have known to do it that way. See, I'm I'm pretty good at diesel engine repair and embryo transfer, but not computer programs. Um, feel free to ask questions on that website. Cool. All righty. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Strickland. If anyone has any other questions, you can reach out to Dr. Mason or Mallory or uh, that outlet that Dr. Strickland just gave you. And uh, thank you all for joining.